Hello, everybody. Welcome to the seminar. I am your host, Justin Long. And we are going to get started here in just a couple of minutes. I'm trying to do an audio check on Facebook. So if you can hear us on Facebook, please put something in the message. Or it is a problem for you. Hello, Justin Long. And then I will know. And we will get started in just a minute. Okay, this is audio check number two. Audio check number two. Are we still static? Yes or no? Okay, working on it.
Can you give me a test one? Test one, two, three. Can you hear me? Test one, two, three. Facebook, can you let us know how this sounds now, please? All right, can everybody hear me? No. Yeah, it's really quiet. Can we get everyone? You guys can't hear now, right? Hold on. Yeah, I think we're getting closer. Now he's just going to make me stand up here and talk randomly to everybody. <laughs> Luckily, it's what I do best. Yeah. Tony, super excited to have all of you guys back tonight. He, uh, he took a front row seat the minute we had the chairs out. We got a great video of him doing the walk down the catwalk. Yeah, we have pretty significant feedback. <laughs> so we got Facebook good, but not live good. We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay. It's right here. 
right. So we're going to do. All right, we're going to do two microphones at the same time. All right, you guys can hear. Can you guys hear on Facebook? Okay, we think we're ready to go. So in Facebook land, feel free to put questions down below and we have got someone here that's gonna help us uh, ask those questions for you. So drop them down below, we'll get them asked for you. Uh, let us know if audio or visual isn't working on Facebook land because we're sort of looking at it, but somehow it never looks the same on ours as it does on yours. So in real time, you guys just scream at me, okay? Yeah, jump up and down, do something. Uh, the cat will say words, you know, all that. So we're super happy to have you guys here. We're super happy to have you guys here. And uh, bring out your calendars on your phone. November 20th, we'll be having our open house. Uh, all kinds of good times. Um, there will be the wellness plan raffle again. Um, there'll be demos, there'll be prizes, there'll be food, there'll be fun. You know, all the things that we have at Open House. Oh, there'll be the, the Kiss the Ass booth again, I believe. Yeah. Who doesn't love a good Kiss the Ass booth? Yeah. Stitch will be raising money to take testicles off of other horses. So there you go. We like to make sure that by kissing the ass, you make the world a better place. So all around. Um, I think that's about it at the moment for things. Uh, we will be kicking off wellness signups on November 1st, but you can, you can sign up at Open House for sure. Um, and if you win it at Open House, we'll just refund you your money. So there you go. Don't worry about signing up too early. And it's never too early to think about Christmas. And what says Merry Christmas to your horse better than a wellness plan? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about real quick this evening before we get into equine asthma is Dr. Staples. So we have Dr. Staples here because she works at Spring Hill Equine on Wednesdays and Thursdays, but the rest of the week she's also available to do advanced podiatry cases. So laminitis, all the things that are, can possibly go wrong with a horse's feet. She is, she's your woman and she's a superwoman. So there we go. Without further ado, I'm going to let her say a few words about how awesome she is. <laughs> Hello everybody, I'm just gonna stand here. My name is Dr. Ellen Staples, I'm from Gainesville, Florida. I'm a veterinarian and a certified journeyman farrier. Um, I'm from here, although I've lived elsewhere for several years, coming back here for veterinary school at UF. I did my farrier training before going to veterinary school and shot, I've been shooting horses since 2013. Um, but like Dr. Latcher said, I do specialize in foot cases. Um, I shoe horses as well out of a farrier trailer um, that is out front here. But I specialize, specialize in white line disease, laminitis, anything that you can think of that affects the foot. Um, I really like working with other farriers, so if you guys have issues um, with you know, your horse's foot and you're sort of scratching your head or your farrier scratching their head about what to do, definitely give me a call. I'm here on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, outside of that, I do have my own practice called Canopy Equine uh, Veterinary and Podiatry. So feel free to give me a call. Otherwise, I'll see you around. Hey guys, it's really good to see you all here. This is Dr. York. Um, I've seen a lot of cases regarding uh, equine asthma lately. Some of uh, the audience, I think I've seen your horses lately for asthma. So uh, very pertinent to talk about this time of year. Um, it's something we, we discuss frequently, I think like, is a little bit misunderstood in equine practice sometimes. Uh, so let's talk about what it is and what we can do about it. Okay, so to begin with, there's a lot of names for this 
spectrum of equine disease. So you've probably heard heaves in the past. Uh, RAO uh, was a name, recurrent airway obstruction that it was changed to a little while ago. COPD is another older name, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease that came from previous human terminology. Uh, IAD, which is inflammatory airway disease, is another term. Um, these are, some of them are the same, some of them are just names for the general condition, and some of them are a little different. We'll talk about the differences between specifically IAD and uh, the asthma type of, um, of uh, equine heaves. So bronchoconstriction is gonna be a similarity between all of these. Uh, and that means the little bronchioles in the lungs narrow. Um, you get excessive mucus uh, secretion in the airways, which sometimes you see coming out of the horse's nose, but not always. And you get obstruction to airflow, uh, which is gonna create the clinical signs that you'll notice on your own horses. So what does it look like when you notice this? Well, it varies, okay? So some of it is gonna be very subtle. You may only notice it when you're riding your horse, occasional cough, that sort of thing. And some of it could be life-threatening. Uh, so we have ranging from poor performance. Your horse is fine when he's in a stall. You get on and he's coughing more than he should. He doesn't have the energy, that sort of thing. Uh, and sometimes it's the horse really doesn't have a good quality of life because he's really working hard to breathe and not able to do the rest of the horsey things. Uh, so faster labored breathing, I've got a video coming up shortly. Uh, coughing, wheezing. I can hear when I put the stethoscope on the horse's lungs, a wheezing sound. You may hear that if it's bad enough when you just stand next to your horse and listen. Um, nostril flare, he looks like he's labored. He looks like he's working to breathe. Uh, and then sometimes, like I said, that nasal discharge, that mucus. Not all the time, but sometimes it's there. Uh, if you look at this picture on the top right of the screen here, um, can you see that line, kind of a shadowed line that, that's happening on the, like between the horse's belly and where you might imagine his rib cage is going to be? So we call that a heave line. Um, and that's hypertrophy of the muscles. So increasing uh, muscle tone in that area because of the work he's having to do breathing. Uh, so we see the muscles really having to work hard to push the air out of the lungs. And if you imagine if you worked out, you went to the gym all the time, your muscles would get bigger. This is what you may see on an advanced case of, um, of equine asthma. So some horses get really skinny and that's because they're spending a lot of their calories that they're trying to take in actually just working to breathe. Um, and they may not just have an interest in, in eating because they're standing there laboring to breathe so much that they're not taking the time out to actually just graze like they should be. So they're gonna be focusing on just surviving, just breathing. So here's a little video we're going to watch, and if you can watch this horse, look at his, his flank area, kind of, oops, it stopped again. See if you can pick up that heave line, and just see how it looks like more effort for that horse to breathe than he usually would be. That was quick. You want to see it one more time? Okay, so I say this is a moderate case, okay? It's not the worst we've ever seen that horse. There's no video or no audio on the video, um, but he's not rasping and, and like, you know, making crazy noises trying to breathe, but he's obviously affected even when he's just standing there, right? So we're gonna talk a little about the spectrum of asthma. And we have two major categories we're gonna break this down into. Uh, the more minor uh, of, the, of the types of uh, cases is gonna be called inflammatory airway disease. Now this is not necessarily just a spectrum of mild to severe. These are a little bit different, uh, but IAD is generally more mild symptoms. Um, so you may see this horse fine when he's in a stall, he's fine around the barn. Uh, you go to tack him up and ride, and then you start noticing some issues, having trouble uh, you know, coughing, just not having the energy, that sort of thing when you're riding him. Um, but a lot of times it's not uh, it's gonna be as severe as uh, if you had a really badly affected heave horse. So IAD horses may not have an actual allergy. This may be just an environmental toxin that's triggering this. Um, can be some, some dust, inflammation, something's causing that inflammation in the lungs, but they're not necessarily allergic to something. Uh, can be horses of all ages. A lot of times we see this in younger horses too. Uh, so if you have a younger horse, let's say less than five, six, seven, uh, we're more likely to be on the IAD spectrum than we are on the, on the heaves and, and RAO uh, side. Uh, so like I said, usually more, um, more mild cases, 
they don't necessarily go on to begin more severe over time as they get older. Uh, not to say they can't, but they don't always turn around to those bad heaves hit cases you see later on. RAO or heaves, on the other hand, um, this is a more clear allergic component. And oftentimes, these are the more severely affected horses and usually the older horses over six. OK, uh, so there's two general forms. One is called like the traditional one, which I find to be more traditional in other areas of country rather than ours. And that's to do with the indoor environment. So poorly ventilated barns, lots of dust, ammonia, uh, lots of uh, shavings, you know, creating dust in the environment. Uh, moldy hay, that sort of thing, dusty bedding. Um, a lot of times, let's say in the north, you might see this more in the winter. Um, as opposed to what I think we see more here in, in Florida, in the southeast, is the second form, which is the summer pasture-associated uh, asthma. So that's what we have um, seasonally, and that's what I'm seeing a lot of right now. So late spring to autumn, I find in the last two weeks, I've seen more than I have all summer. Uh, so, you know, it may depend on what that horse is individually allergic to, but we have a lot of stuff blooming out there right now. You may have noticed it's not raining quite as much as it was, like when it was doing every afternoon in the summer, and it's been windy for a couple days. So we are seeing a lot of that, and it may be associated with what's blooming and how the weather's been. So these guys uh, with summer pasture-associated asthma are often in the field for the most part, uh, turned out more than 12 hours. Uh, they may be associated with, uh, with pollen and mold spores. And of course, right now, well, really all summer, we've had a lot of heat, we've had a lot of humidity, and those things increase the way the allergens affect the lungs. So what's really, really important with this is that we know when we go to treat this respiratory condition, we are treating the appropriate condition. Uh, because if you treat, let's say, a bacterial pneumonia the same way you would treat a heat horse, uh, you'll send this spiraling in a terrible direction. So really important to have one of the vets out uh, to diagnose appropriately what this is before we start giving treatments, because the treatment for pneumonia is guaranteed to make um, uh, heaves much worse and, and vice versa. So bacterial pneumonia, viral, like inflammatory um, influenza, that sort of thing, um, lungworms and upper airway disease can all be things that have similar signs. Um, so make sure your veterinarian takes a look at your horse so you can appropriately get on the right path. Dr. Abbott's going to come up and talk to us about diagnosis of heaves, IAD, in just a moment. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. All right. All right, y'all can hear me? Great. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about diagnosing heaves um, or equine asthma um, for the next couple of slides. Like Dr. York was saying, we're definitely going to, then I hit the wrong button, I'm good at this. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about having your veterinarian out and what we're gonna look for when we come out to look at your horse if you think it has heaves. The first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna do a physical exam. Or we do on any of the horses that we go to see every day. Uh, we're gonna take a heart rate, a respiratory rate, and their temperature. We're gonna listen for gut sounds, probably check for digital pulses, just make sure your horse, check its mucous membranes and, and capillary refill time, make sure that your horse is in good general health. Um, normal temperature for horse, this time of year it can be upwards of 101.5, but we really like to see it in the 100 range. It can just be a little bit higher right now if your horse has been outside in the sun or whatnot. We don't really take too much into consideration if it's pushing up in the 101.5 range. Um, normal heart rate for a horse is between 30 and 40. Um, so if a heart rate is over 40, 50, 60, we have to think about a pain component. Horses get, or horses get a high heart rate if they're in pain. They can also have a high heart rate if they've just gotten here from trailering and they're in a new environment and they're a little bit nervous. So we also take that into consideration. If they just get off the trailer here, they're in a new place and their heart rate's 45, 50, we're gonna give them a few minutes and retake their heart rate. Same with respiratory rate, new smells, um, all of that. But we want a respiratory rate to be below about 24, 20, 30, we're okay if we're in a situation where it's really hot, they just got off a trailer, it, those kind of things, we'll, we'll take that into consideration, but we really want a nice, slow, relaxed respiratory rate. 
horses with heaves, like you saw in the video that Dr. York showed you, they're gonna have an increased respiratory rate along with an increased respiratory effort. Also, what Dr. York was saying and mentioning quick, briefly is when we're listening to the lungs, we're not just listening to count a, a respiratory rate. We're listening to hear if there's any abnormal sounds. Crackles, wheezes, rubs are the typical things that we will hear. Crackles sound like bubble wrap. If you ever, you know, when you were a kid, you played with the bubble wrap, but you think about popping those really, really quickly, that's what crackles will sound like to us. Wheezes are almost a whistle. I can't whistle, I won't whistle. You guys will not like listening to me whistle, so we won't do that. Um, and then rubs are kind of described as kind of walking on fresh snow. If you're not familiar with what walking on fresh snow sounds like, find a video of it. It's not fun, don't go north, it's too cold. Um, so a way, a way we can diagnose between heaves, inflammatory airways, um, and then say like an infectious prob uh, problem in the lungs is between a bronchoalveolar bronchio lavage or BAL and what's called a transtracheal wash. So the, the BAL um, is very specific. What we do is we pass a, a clean tube um, it's not super sterile because we're going up the horse's nasal passage. So there's obviously going to be allergens and uh, bacteria and whatnot in the nasal passage. So it's not a super sterile procedure, it's a clean procedure. Um, so we pass this tube up your horse's nose, into his airway, down the trachea, into his airway. And we place sterile saline through the tube, it makes your horse cough, they think we're drowning them, they think it's the worst thing in the world, but it's not, they survive, they'll be fine. Um, and then what we do is we aspirate back that fluid. And that sample that we get will look often a little bit like this syringe here. It has a nice little foam on the top, which we call a surfactant, and then um, the fluid beneath it. The fluid is gonna have our cells in it. And the cells can be macrophages, lymphocytes, neutrophils, mast cells, eosinophils, definitely some bacteria, because like I said, there's gonna be bacteria up the nasal passage. But what we will see on a horse who has heaves or asthma is we're going to see an increase in some of these cells and a decrease in some of these cells. There's actually going to be a decrease in the number of macrophages in this solution. Macrophages are normal in a horse's airway. They're what go in and get rid of all that bacteria. They will be decreased in a horse with heaves. Um, the mast cells are going to be way up. Those are definitely inflammatory cells and those are going to be super high and sometimes we'll see an increase in the eosinophils as well and neutrophils. The transtracheal trans tra wash is less specific because we're going to a very specific area in the horse's airway. Um, or, yeah, so we're not getting a diffuse, yeah, we're not getting a very wide area of disease, we're getting a very specific area of it. Um, this one is a sterile procedure, so what we actually end up doing is we basically go through tracheal rings with a large needle and a catheter, and then we pass this catheter in through the, uh, in through the trachea down to an area in the lungs, and we do the same thing. We put sterile water in and we aspirate it back. We get a similar sample back, but what that is going to tell us is if the bacteria that we're getting is real. So if we have bacteria on our BAL, and we have bacteria on our transtracheal wash, we may have a pneumonia. If we have bacteria on our BAL and not on our transtracheal wash, then it's probably heaves. Yeah. Um, but it definitely helps us to identify an infectious cause. Pulmonary function test isn't really done, done very often. Um, it's for those that we really don't get great answers from the BAL or the transtracheal wash. This is one of the ones that's done at a referral um, hospital and what they do with this is they put a nebulizer on your horse and they start to slowly introduce allergens um, and when they do that they the horse is hooked up to all sorts of monitors and when they introduce allergens they start low and they work their way up and they measure how much input and output your horse's lungs are um, are doing with each breath and then they get to a point that say okay this is what's causing your horse to have the trouble breathing, and this is how much you know, allergen is causing it. Um, it's, it's a pretty cool test, but like I said, it's not done super often. Usually we get them diagnosed with a BAL or a transtracheal wash. Um, the other thing that we can do is endoscopy. So we take our little scope, put our little camera on it. Um, we again go up the nose and into the trachea. And what this is gonna tell us 
it will help us, we can collect a sample that way. Again, it won't be a sterile sample, but we could collect a sample that way. But it's also going to show us how much mucus is in the trachea. If there's a little bit of mucus, everyone has a little bit of mucus. I cough in the morning when I get up. You guys cough when you get up. Your horse probably coughs a little bit if you when you first get on it. That's, that's pretty normal, right? Um, but if there's a lot of mucus, we're going to be able to see it with the, um, with the scope. We can also rule out exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage, which is when, what you would know um, known as a horse that bleeds when it exercises. Uh, you can kind of rule that out. That scope does have to be done immediately after or while working if you're looking for that, um, the bleeding. And so this is, this here's a picture of the um, tracheal mucus grade. So this one is probably a mild to moderate. You can see there's a little bit of mucus here and here, but probably not something that's causing major amount of constriction or a major issue with the, this horse. And this one, you can see it has a whole pool of mucus. Um, you can even see that the, the tracheal um, mucosa below it is pretty inflamed and irritated. So that's kind of a normal and abnormal for you in that. The other thing that we like to do is blood work. It's always a good idea to have baseline blood work on your horse, whether they're having an issue or not. That way, if there is an issue and we pull blood, we can compare the two. Um, a complete blood cell count is going to give us a white cell count, which if your horse were to have something like pneumonia and not heaves, we're going to know that there's something infectious going on. Um, gives us red cell count, hydration status, all of those things. Again, one of those things is always just a good idea to have on your horse. Fibrinogen is an, a marker of inflammation. So we're going to know that if there's inflammatory, in, something inflammatory go, going on in your horse, that's going to be elevated. Um, a chemistry is going to give us idea of kind of all of your organ functions, your kidney and liver disease, if anything like that could be painful to your horse and causing an increased respiratory rate and it's not actually related to lungs at all. A serum amyloid A um, and lactate are also two other tests that we get to do in the field, which are a great idea, give us a great um, indication of what's happening right now. And if there's a lot of inflammation going on right now and while we wait for these, those other tests to come back. And um, Dr. Lachter is going to come in and talk a little bit about treatment for you guys. Okay, so we have a question on Facebook about she puts her horse in an air-conditioned stall and maintains him on low-dose decks. So we're going to sort of get to the answer on that question. I'm going to fully answer it when I'm all done. So in Facebook land, hold on, I'm getting to you. So. The definitive treatment for these guys would be to put them in a bubble. But A, I'm impressed that this horse is in fact in a bubble. And then canters around and does like a hamster show in the bubble. So uh, my hat is off to whoever got their horse to do that. So that's impressive all in its own. Um, it will get that horse out of an environment that has a lot of allergens in it and allow you to perfectly maintain their environment. So there's that. But for the rest of us <laughs> that cannot keep our horses in a bubble, let alone ride them in a bubble, um, we have two big treatment goals when it comes to any of these airway diseases when we're talking about inflammatory airway or equine um, asthma, REO, heaves. Uh, we want to reduce that mucus that you saw on the endoscope and we want to open the airway. And so all of our treatments are aimed at doing those two things. There's two big ways that we do this. One is an inhaled treatment. Well, there's a bunch of inhaled treatments out there. We're going to get into one of the newer ones later. We have a really cool demo over here that we're going to do at the end. Um, they are incredibly effective incredibly effective. They have minimal side effects. The biggest one being that favorite side effect of horses. They take a lot of money out of your wallet. Yeah. Um, there are also oral treatments available that come with more side effects, but fewer dollars out of your wallet. And for us very often, it is a balance of all of those trying to keep the horses happy. So uh, how do we get rid of mucus? We get rid of mucus by getting rid of inflammation. Mucus is just dead white blood cells and white blood cells are there because of the inflammation. And so we need to get rid of that inflammation to get rid of the mucus. 
We do this mostly through the use of steroids, uh, and those can be inhaled or given orally. The most common one that we use on um, the older asthmatic horse is dexamethasone. And we can give that orally. It actually has better availability to the system orally than as an intramuscular injection. So why not go easy and put it in their food? So that's what we usually do. The trick to that is that if we have uh, the older overweight horse, which often goes together, uh, then we increase our risk of laminitis. And while we really, really, really like Dr. Staples, we don't want to use her for laminitis cases unless we absolutely have to. So we try not to induce them to then use her. Uh, so on those older overweight horses, we sometimes have to be really careful on how high we go with those steroids. We can switch to another steroid called prednisolone. Um, you guys may have heard of prednisone. It's commonly used in people. It is the cheaper version of prednisolone, but being horses, they can't use that one because they don't have the enzyme in their liver they need. So they're gonna go with the more expensive one because they're horses. Why wouldn't they? Yeah, cats are also the same way. Uh, the other thing that we will sometimes use, not great luck, more often we use it on the, the younger horse that is showing us that they have some inflammation. They may have recently gone to a horse show and picked up a little bit of a virus. They've had a fever. We're on, you know, kind of like you or I when we get a cold and we've got that long tail of a cough that we just can't get rid of. On those guys, we'll often use just the non steroidals like butyrbanamine to help just quiet the inflammation a little bit. We don't need to pull out the big dogs. We just need a little help. And that's where the buttes and the banamines will help us in those guys. They do very little to help us with an acute heaves or asthma crisis. There is some work on omega fatty acids helping these guys. It's, it's a help, right? It's definitely not a cure-all, but it certainly helps to reduce inflammation and has been shown to help modify very mild um, asthma cases and reduce doses of dexamethasone in horses who are on it on a daily basis. So omega fatty acids are, are never a bad answer on these guys. Uh, my favorite in horses is flaxseed. Um, the one thing you have to watch is flaxseed has to be freshly ground. It can't be over like a week or 10 days old. It goes rancid and then you lose all those benefits. So you want to either get something stabilized like Triple Crown Naturals. Um, they have a flaxseed they make that's stabilized. It's good for a year, I think, is the, the expiration date on. It's a pretty good product. Um, or Purina has a new Omega product that is really high. They even have a new ration balancer, which is super cool because it's the combination of basically their Omega product and a low calorie feed. So I'm super interested in, in chatting with the Purina folks about that feed. They did not pay me to say that, by the way. I wish they would pay me in feed, but they don't. So Omega fatty acids may be something to add to your horse's diet if they're affected by this. The other thing we can do with mucus that is not particularly effective in horses, but we can make it easier to get it out. Uh, and those are cough syrups. I, I don't know of a cough syrup, single cough syrup that's legal for horse shows that drug test, but it can sometimes help on these horses that we're not anywhere near showing and we're trying to thin secretions and just get them up and out. They're horses, so they require a lot of cough syrup. And Again, it doesn't work great, but it can, it can help a little bit in the early stages while we're getting them under control. Opening airways. This is done through drugs called bronchodilators. This is where the inhaled guys really, really, really shine. Uh, most of the, what we use in horses is either albuterol or salmeterol, which they're, they're very closely related. Albuterol, if you're a human who has asthma, is what's in your rescue inhaler. So if you have an inhaler available that you use when you're having an acute attack and they're like, take this, that's albuterol. Um, there is a syrup form of it, but being horses, they don't absorb it. Yep, they're like, nope, just kidding. There's a slightly different version of it. It's a first cousin called clenbuterol, which is sold under the drug name Ventipulmin. Um, we can use that on horses. The problem is they tolerate to it very quickly. So it's only, it only functions for about 10 days. Uh, and then we have to have, make sure that we have other things on board to get them under control. 
So we'll use that as more of a rescue drug or something for you guys to have on hand in case things get out of control. You've got Ventapulmin to, to help when it's not on back order, which it currently is. But hopefully that'll get fixed soon. Anyway, no matter what bronchodilator it is, whether it's albuterol, clenbuterol, or salmeterol, definitely not allowed in show horses uh, because it can cause hyperactivity as a side effect. So there's, there's two big things that we look at when we're looking for drugs is complete rabbit hole for horses and showing is you can't hype them up and you can't calm them down. So if the drugs have that as a side effect, it's a no-go. Um, for bronchodilators, we have short acting and long acting, and that's the biggest difference between like salmeterol, that's a very long acting bronchodilator, it lasts for about 24 to 36 hours, versus albuterol only lasts for about 45 minutes to an hour. The key on a lot of these guys is that you get the airway open and then the muscles don't trigger back. So you get the anti-inflammatory in there working on the inflammation creating this and then the bronchodilator on board to, to kind of get things going and then you get the system to calm down. Uh, steroids do this a little bit, but it's through a complicated mechanism. Um, some of our sedatives can do this. So we'll use, a, like you guys have probably heard us use the word xylazine or rompum. Um, I just showed my age there, but um, those drugs can actually dilate airways. So if we have a horse in crisis, it may seem odd that sometimes we give them a little bit of sedation, but a little bit of that sedation has a side effect of dilating the, the airways. Um, anticholinergics are big things like atropine, we try not to use those because they have a lot of, those are very basic drugs in the body. They're in charge of a lot of functions. And so when you give a drug like that, they have a lot of side effects. So while yes, we may get them breathing again, we're gonna end up with a whole bunch of side effects, one of them being colic. And don't we love to cause that one? Um, so we only use atropine if we act absolutely have to, otherwise it's a drug we really stay away from. Theophylline is commonly used in humans as well. If you had a kid with asthma, um, that's a drug that they'll often keep around for kids because it's very well absorbed orally in humans. Um, it does work well in horses, but they get uh, super jittery off of it. So do children. Um, they, they get really jittery off it and they, they don't love it. So they don't tolerate it well. It does the job, they just don't tolerate it well. So these are some of the ways that we have to do inhaled. And this is the biggest, the biggest issue we have with the inhaled products is that they, they take a little bit of finagling to get them into a horse because for our mouth and we say, breathe deeply, that doesn't go well with horses. We can't put something to them and say, now breathe deep and let's get this all the way in. So most of these products are designed to work with the horse's airflow to put, uh, so like we have the, um, the Flexi Neb right here. Can you guys see my mouse there? It's the pink thing up in the corner. Um, the Flexi Neb basically puts an aerosol into there and then the horse breathes that aerosol and it's put into a really, really fine mist. Um, in a pinch, we have used human nebulizer systems. Uh, they do work pretty well. You have to use more drug than you do in any of the other systems, but the advantage to them is they're readily available and we can get drugs for them pretty easily from human pharmacies. Um, this is a system similar to the FlexiNeb. And the, the biggest downside of these is you have to use uh, liquid medication. So it limits us sometimes on what we can use versus this guy here. This is called an AeroMask and this is called the Aerohippus. If you see on the end of it, it's got kind of the human looking inhaler. The advantage to those systems is that we can use human drugs. Human drugs are very expensive, like very expensive. So that is the drawback. They will get, um, for example, fluticasone, which is a common human drug for asthma, is about $110 for um, it's three to four days of dosing. So they can be incredibly expensive but they're very, very, very effective. We also have a new player on the market, which we have been using. It came out about a year ago. Um, 
And we used it a couple times last year. So far, we've used it a couple times this year already. But this is called the Acervo inhaler. Um, it has take. It's got a lot of things about it that we really like. And one of the things is that the steroid that's in there is not activated until it hits the lungs. So we don't have to worry about that horse that is fat and has the potential to founder because the steroid isn't being absorbed into the system when it goes through the mucosa of your, your nose or your mouth. It's not even working until it hits the lungs. So we're putting steroid where we need it. Uh, and it's also been designed, we'll, we'll demonstrate it here in a minute, but it's also been designed for the horse nostril. So that's really nice. Um, for us, it has saved our behind on some horses that we just, we cannot get under control no matter what we do. Like we've, we've thrown all the drugs at them and they're going out of control for us in a hurry. Um, it has also helped us with horses that we have newly diagnosed. We'll start them here, get them under control, and then we can manage them on significantly lower doses. The big drawback to this guy is like everything else, it's, it's pretty pricey. It's 10 days of therapy, 10 days of therapy. Um, we've got Stacy here from BI who makes this, so that's who I'm getting my answers from is directly from the source. So I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's 10 days, but it's been a long day, so. Um, and the, the side effects have been very minimal and the results have been very positive for us, so that's been great. A few of the oral treatments that we talked about um, I didn't mention Zyrtec earlier. Zyrtec is, it helps us on some of these guys. The advantage of Zyrtec, Cetirizine is the generic. It's super cheap. It's beyond cheap. And what on horses is cheap, right? Uh, it, for us, manages some of our mild, mild horses. And on our other guys, it helps us get the other treatments down to a level that your pocketbook can handle. So Zyrtec can be an add-on, but again, definitely not something you can use on a horse that's showing versus prednisolone and dexamethasone we can use on horses that are showing in very specific doses. So um, Zyrtec though is, is cheap, it's easy, they eat it well, it's well tolerated, we don't have side effects. It doesn't always work, but um, for lots of them it does, so it's certainly worth a try. Now, back to the person who puts their horse in an air-conditioned stall. This is what they're managing right here, is the environment. And the environment is huge, huge. The drawback we have in Florida is that most horses are allergic to the green stuff out there. And in a rainy year like we've had, we have a lot of green stuff and it's everywhere. So even if you don't have grass on your property, <laughs> there's grass not far away, and the pollen's gonna blow. We all know what it's like here in the spring when the pine trees are blooming and everything is yellow. Grass pollen is doing the same thing. We just can't see it as well. And most of these horses have an allergy to grass pollen. So they're spending the summer kind of building up on that allergy and now is when we're seeing them fall off the, the cliff of being able to breathe. Uh, we have the same problem with Tony the cat here. He's also allergic to grass. So he spends the most of the year kind of getting a little itchier, a little itchier, a little itchier, and then we're trying to manage him this time of year, um, and he's full on itchy. We won't even talk about what drugs he's on. Uh, but that's, that's our biggest issue in horses in this area. So by putting them into an air conditioned stall, what happens when you walk in your house during pine pollen season? There's not nearly as much pollen floating around in your house because you've got the air conditioning on and it's getting filtered out. So air conditioned stalls, really, really, really help these guys if it's an option at all. Uh, I think it was Susan on Facebook who has this set up. And what they've got is um, a very well insulated, um, narrow stall that has an air conditioner in it and fans on the ceiling so it blows the air down. And then it has like one of those freezer, you know, walk through freezer strips that comes down and it's in the horse's pasture. Now they're super fancy, like it turns on when the horse, the fans turn on when the horse walks in. I, I'm, I don't think I could get that fancy, but it's impressive. And the horse walks in and will stand in there for a while until he feels better and then he'll walk back out. And it's, it, it's probably the slickest design I've ever seen for an air conditioned stall for a horse that lets the horse go in and out as they want. And he absolutely does. Like he'll go in and stand there for a while 
And uh, we came by to see him and I was like, where's the horse? And as we walked in to the, the barn area and the, the, the stall is in the back area, all of a sudden you see this like big, huge Percheron butt backing out. <laughs> and he's like, hey, here I am. But that's how he stays really comfortable. And I, like I said, I thought it was probably one of the slickest, easiest ways I've seen to put a horse in an air-conditioned stall in Florida. But that's managing all that dust. Some things you can do without an air-conditioned stall are putting these guys under fans. Um, they help to blow the pollen through the air kind of faster, so it's actually harder for them to absorb it. So putting them in a stall up north, they're like, don't put them in a barn down here put them in a barn. Um, there's a little bit less pollen running through your barn. Putting fans in helps kind of move it through faster and they're less likely to, to breathe it in. It's not 100%, but it certainly helps. We wet everything down. We wet down hay, we wet down grain, anything they eat, we wet down. The other thing we look at is bedding in the stall and we try to be very careful about what that bedding is. Um, the, the hemp or the Flax, there we go, flax. Hemp or flax comes as a, um, it's basically a chopped up straw that has no dust for these guys and is really well tolerated by the allergic horses. Um, you can do like the, the pine pellet bedding, even though it gets dusty, it has been extruded. So all of the pollens have been basically killed that are in it. Uh, so a lot of allergic horses will do better with the, the pine pelleted bedding, as long as you keep it wet down just enough so it's not super dusty. Um, but it takes out some of the environmental allergens that are in the shavings that aren't necessarily as um, cooked, basically, as the pine pellets. So looking at your environment and trying to manage the things in your environment that you can to reduce dust will really help these guys a lot. And finally, we have allergy testing and then allergy shots. Uh, what we do with this is, as you can see on this horse here, we just take a bunch of little allergens and inject them underneath the skin. And then we see who has the biggest dots. We correlate that to what she's most allergic to. And then we make a vaccine for what they're most allergic to. Um, I can tell you that in Florida, it is almost always oak pollen <laughs> and uh, bahia grass pollen. <laughs> we don't have any of that around here. <laughs> so they're very allergic to those. And then we can look at some of the feed materials and try and decide like if they show up really positive to alfalfa, that's probably something we want to pull out of their diet if we can at all, so that we can reduce the the contribution that alfalfa makes to their allergies. The toughest part about allergy testing is that it takes a good 12 to 18 months to decide if it's working. Uh, and the younger the horse, the better. Once they hit around 18 years of age, the immune system gets a little bit senile and it doesn't respond as well to the allergy shots. So that, that's a problem on the older horse. And then, you know, nine times out of 10, we're recognizing heaves in a horse that's over 18 or 19, right? So it takes this out of the running, unfortunately. So with that said, who's got questions? Can asthma be passed down to a foal? Can asthma be passed down to a foal is a Facebook question, which is a great question. Uh, yes. So allergic air, uh, skin disease, allergic airway disease, these are all allergy diseases. They are heritable. It is not direct. So we can't say that, yes, mom has allergies. Baby's going to have allergies. Yes, dad does. Baby's going to there's a pretty decent chance. So it's, it's greater than 50%. It's up in the 60 to 70% chance that they're gonna have allergies as a foal. So keep that in mind when you're breeding these horses. Ooh, and we have a demonstration. Forgot about the demonstration. Stacy didn't forget about the demonstration. All right, you guys got questions? Anybody got questions? Or, or do you wanna play with the, the super cool horse nose? Because it's really fun. Yeah, the advantage of being here live is you guys can all come play with the horse nose. It's really fun. <laughs> it's it's kind of, yeah, it's like one of those little, uh, the stress balls. Yeah, it's really great. Okay, Stacy, you gonna come help me out with the, the demo here? Oh, yeah, we got 
activate, right? You want to do that? Yeah, do you can do it. Because I got to hold a microphone. Okay, Stacy's going to demo. If you guys want to come up closer, feel free, but we'll also let you guys all play. So if you'll stay kind of on that side of the microphone, right, or on the, um, the camera, right? Okay, but we're going to let you guys all play. So, okay, so first we activate, right? Left hand. Got to go, and it's left, it's all left. It has to be left. Left hand, left nostril. Okay, activate. You're going to push this all the way in. So we push it in. Until it's gone, so you can't see it anymore. All gone, can't see it. Then we're going to prime three times. We're going to squeeze the handle three times, right? Full pull, and then you do a half until it clicks. Let go. Full pull, half pull, and let go. Full pull, half pull, and let go. And I'm pretty sure there's a video that talks yeah. about this. Yeah. You don't have to remember it. No. <laughs> so then you're ready. You're ready to go for the 10 days. So then you're going to hold your horse however you feel comfortable. This way, this way. Most of the time it's this way. Depends how much they like the clicking. <laughs> so we're going to try and convince them they would like to keep their head down. Yes. Okay. So you're have you found that food helps with that? Yes. Um, okay, so definitely food. treats. Chewy treats. Yes. Stud muffins gets you, yeah. gets you the winner every time. Yeah. 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 So you're going to hold your arm up like this. Holding your arm up. Push your, put the nostril adapter in the nose and turn it so that you have a nice seal around the nostril adapter. This is called the um, breath indicator. So when you have that seal around the nostril adapter, the breath indicator is going to go in and out. Okay. So you're going to put it in. You're going to turn it. So we're going to be we're going to be watching right here mm -hmm. for it to puff up. Yep. Okay. And then you're going to do a full pull and a half pull and let go and you'll see the mist come in here and then when the horse inhales it'll go in. The the main thing is that you have to do the full pull and then the half pull. Ooh. And that's when you see the mist come out. Okay. So the treatment is eight puffs twice a day. Eight days. puffs twice a day, you said? Mm -hmm. For days, 10 days? For day oh, one through five. Day one through five. And then 12 puffs once a day for days six through 10. And then 12 puffs once a day, six through 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's it. We can pass around. Yeah, well, everyone here is going to get to come try it. But how's Facebook land feel about that? All right. Let down. Let down, left out. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. You didn't get the goodie bags either. I'm sorry. But if we've got all the questions answered, we um, are going to say thank you guys so much for coming. Remember to look for our open house on November 20th. You can come see Tony and the rest of us. And if you've got any questions you think of later, drop them down below and we'll try to get them answered for you. Thank you guys. Okay, now you guys can all come up and play.